Okay, well, can you all hear me here? Does this work? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. It's awesome to see so many people after an amazing lunch. I'm glad you're not all sleeping it off somewhere. Welcome back to the afternoon track here at Lambda at Build Stuff 2022. Uh, just a quick notice before we get started again. Remember on the back of your... Um, badge you've got the uh, treasure hunt to go around the sponsors sponsors make it possible to do this kind of thing so we try to be a little bit nice to them sometimes um and with that out of the way i would like to introduce our next speaker on the lambda track adele carpenter software engineer at trifork based in amsterdam hello fellow digital person <laughs> and um adele works on backing systems for education and i don't want to steal any more of your time so take it away Thank you. So, yeah, <laughs> thanks. All right, haven't even said anything yet. You might take it back. Anyway, um, this talk is really quick for times, or not quick for time. It will take up most like, all of this session, so it might be that I run two or three minutes over. If you do want to leave it exactly on time, that's fine. I won't be offended, but stay with me. The last two or three minutes are worth it. So, a teacher, an economist, and a developer walk into a bar and take a seat. Immediately, they start debating who has the easiest job. The economist turns to the teacher. You obviously have the easiest job. You play with kids all day and get the summers off. The teacher, looking rightly offended, disagrees. There's no way I have the easiest job. Clearly, economists have the easiest job. You just pull predictions out of thin air, and it doesn't even matter if they're wrong. The economist takes a deep breath as if about to launch into a rebuttal, but instead just looks at the developer. What? Cries the developer? Don't look at me. Why, just today I wrote over 400 lines of code, fully unit tested. Then I had a meeting to plan the next program increment. Have you ever heard of that? It's basically just predicting the future and management take it way too seriously. So not only do I not get summers off, I have to predict the future and suffer the consequences if I'm wrong. Yeah, says the economist. But your table has a ping uh, your office has a ping pong table, right? So good afternoon everyone. Thanks for choosing to attend my session. My name's Adele and I'm a software engineer at Trifork Amsterdam and I just screwed up the punchline. But there's no doubt that as software professionals, we do have a uniquely demanding job and it goes so far beyond what is taught in the average computer science degree. You know, there are all of these other activities that we are ex expected to participate in in order to do our jobs well. Now, just quickly, who in this room has a computer science degree? Okay, and uh, I can see a few hands going up, but not too many. So I can, see, can assume that some of you don't have a computer science degree. Yeah, okay, a few hands, great. So this is nice to know that I am not the only one. We do have a bit of a variety in the audience, and this is great. This is what I do love to see. So my study background is uh, civil engineering and economics. I've also spent some time working in marketing and sales. And these experiences from different areas is where the idea for this talk came from. I just found myself thinking a bit differently than my colleagues, especially in my early days as a developer. Of course, I had mega imposter syndrome days, and I still do. But I learned pretty quickly to leverage what I did know rather than beating myself up for not knowing what others knew. So that's where the idea for this talk came from. It's a mix of my personal experience and interests, as well as some professions that I wanted to learn more about. And I'm going to share these findings with you through storytelling, because I know that conference life is hard. We just had lunch, and our brains can only take so much fact dumping at once. So sit back and relax, and hopefully you do learn something. So the Tories, stories you're about to hear center around a team, some issues they face and how they work through them. The team is loosely based on my team at Trifork, only the names, characters, locations and events are different. So in the newly formed team, we have the tech lead, Malcolm, project manager, RJ, and some devs. And being a project-based consultancy, the PO and domain expert is the main contact at the customer. And the team has been assembled to improve the relationship with the customer and transition away from being a feature factory to being a true technology partner. 
The team has inherited a large and ageing Java project. The project could be described as less than joyful to work on. And most of the dev teams are f uh, devs on the team are far from excited uh, to have this project represent their current reality, <laughs> despite their smiling faces. So immediately, one of the devs feels overwhelmed and starts complaining to Malcolm, one of the most patient and level-headed people you could ever meet. Malcolm, exclaims junior dev leaker. It's taken me three days to set up my environment just to work on this project. The key parts of the project are finally building, but it takes over 15 minutes. The code base is hard to navigate. Technical debt is off the charts. And the documentation sucks. How on earth are we supposed to work like this? We need to start rebuilding this ASAP, get out of the 2010s and into the 2020s. Malcolm responds calmly. Leaker. You were right, this is a tough project and clearly the priorities of the previous team are not the same as ours. Let's just spend some time pairing and promote this practice within the team. This should help us optimize our workflow. We can create tickets as we go. Although Malcolm had helped Leaker's anxiety levels to drop, she was not convinced of the approach. The only way she can see is a rewrite. Over lunch, she brings up the topic with RJ. RJ listens intently. By the time Lika has finished monologuing, RJ's lunch is gone while hers has barely been touched. Lika, he says, have you heard of opportunity cost? Lika shakes her head. Opportunity costs occur whenever there is a trade-off between two options. It's the cost of the options or opportunities that you give up when you make a decision in terms of other goods and services. Uh, what? Lika looks as lost as a back-end developer at a UX conference. So let's think about what you're proposing here. It looks like we have two options. Keep working on this old project, accepting lower developer joy and velocity for the foreseeable period, or we rewrite the damn thing. Do you agree? Yes, replies Lika. Okay, so what do you think it would cost to rebuild the worst parts of the project? So the core service and the reporting service. Lika goes into full estimation mode. So rough estimate, take three developers, 12 months, it's called 2100 hours. Based on my rate, it's 200K, but we probably need some senior dev time, so let's make it even 250K. Okay, 250K, replies RJ. Is that everything? Yeah, replies Lika. And I guess we'd have to convince the customer that it's a good idea. Okay, replies RJ. Now let me ask you, given the current velocity of the team, what's the value to the customer of the features three developers could deliver in 12 months? Lika shrugs her shoulders. I have no idea. It would be much more than 250K, replies RJ. Ah, replies Lika. She sees where RJ is coming from. But wait, she says, surely our faster velocity after the rebuild will make up for it. Okay, so how much faster do you think we can be after the rebuild? We can double our velocity, says Lika confidently. RJ starts scribbling on a napkin. He says, assuming your estimate is accurate, we produce nothing for one year, then twice as much the next year as the year before the rewrite. Yes. And so then at the end of year two, we are at the same position as when we started. End of year three, we have done 1.3 times the work we otherwise would have. End of year four, 1.5 times. That's assuming that the velocity on the rebuild doesn't drop at all. Lika starts to see RJ's point. RJ continues, I've worked with Malcolm for a long time. I know what we can do with the right team. There is no way that we will finish the year with the same velocity that we have now. We can do this. So this is admittedly a very simplistic explanation of opportunity cost, but in this case, it was all that RJ needed to get buy-in from Lika. And we can summarize it as the cost to do the thing plus the cost of not doing a different thing. So let's explore this a little further and go through some choices that we might encounter as developers and the factors that we need to consider as it relates to opportunity cost. So with Lika and RJ, we saw the rewrite versus improved decision, and here are some others. So with respect to internal tooling libraries and frameworks, we have the direct cost to run, build, and to maintain, uh, for example, salaries and hosting. 
But what about other costs like learning curve for new developers or the willingness of those developers to work for a company with custom internal tooling? Because it's not just the company that assumes the cost. The, the employee has a cost as well. It could result in what I'm going to call junk professional development, which is learning with low transference to future positions. For example, learning to use a custom framework instead of something like Spring. And we also have the choice between custom or SaaS. And so has anyone in here heard of Wardley mapping? Yeah, a couple of hands, nice. Uh, he has this brilliant method of mapping the drivers of value along a continuum from brand new to commodity. And the more of a commodity something is, the better it is to buy or rent than it is to build it yourself. So computing used to be a value add, for example, but now it's a commodity. And essentially, it boils down to, is the thing we want to build, is it our core business, our competitive advantage, the thing that separates us from the competition and if the answer is no then you need to reach for the ass and this is a conversation or discussion that we often have with our customers and potential customers at Trifork we build custom enterprise solutions so the discussion of why we should hire you or buy off the shelf comes up a lot and guiding them through this is basically a question of, is it your core business? Not only to keep the customer happy, but also because we don't want to build something that already exists. Next up, we have learning and development. And the opportunity cost of becoming an expert is reducing the number of areas where you know things. And the opportunity cost of knowing a little about a lot is a high level of expertise in one area. Meetings also have an opportunity cost because the cost of keeping everybody on the same page is interrupting employee workflow. As we know, that 10-minute meeting is never 10 minutes. You've got to get mentally ready for it and then wind down afterwards and ramp up, back up your work pace. And in the case of uh, maintenance versus development, we have the classic example of uh, taking on technical debt to go fast now, accepting a poorer implementation and a higher chance of bugs to get software in the hands of users now. So let's rejoin RJ, Malcolm and Lika, but not from where we left them. We're going to join them in an alternate reality, one where RJ doesn't understand opportunity cost and where Lika gets her way. So the team does decide in this alternate reality to rewrite the core service and the reporting service. This is going to be a big bang replacement and the customer does agree that a rewrite is the best move. However, a year is far too long and they need to set a deadline of three months. So with the classic mythical man month logic, RJ throws 12 developers on the project. And this is how you know that it's an alternate reality. RJ just happens to have a spare 12 developers that he can throw on a project at a moment's notice. Anyway, other than the oversupply of developers and Lika getting her way, this reality is the same as the previous one. So what happens next is very, very predictable. The end of month three rolls around, nothing's being delivered. And despite this, the team's very invested in the project and they ask for more time and resources. And RJ doesn't want to look like a fool and neither does the customer. So not only is the project extended for another three months, another six developers are added. And at the end of these three months, the project is still not complete. However, the commitment of the original sponsors remains as strong as ever. Developers are complaining about rework and changing unclear requirements, but it's fine. We're still in the reality where developers are easy to find. And besides, they've come this far. It would be a waste to abandon all the work that the team have already done. And sure enough, the project gets extended for another six months. Finally, at month 10 of the now 12-month project, the board gets involved and they are livid. This project is costing five times the original estimate and taking four times as long. How on this alternate earth did we get here? So can you help the board out? Do you have any ideas what's happening here? Uh, one of too little communication between developers and the board. 
Yeah, I mean, communication is always part of the game, right? But the answer I was looking for today is the sunk cost fallacy. So the sunk cost fallacy is the tendency to continue an endeavor once an investment of money, effort, and time has been made. So in other words, the tendency to throw good money after bad. And at month three and month six, there are signs that the project is doomed. The most rational thing to do would be to shut the project down. But the money that's already spent, that's a sunk cost. There's no way that you can recover that. But giving up would feel like a waste. So RJ and the team press on. And at the beginning of a project, when deciding on the best approach, we're often less emotionally invested in any particular course of action. It's easier to think through the opportunity cost of our decisions. But as more work is done, the emotional attachment to the project increases and we let those emotions get in the way of our decision making. And this leads us to continue to devoting resources to a failing course of action. In management and psychology, they use the term escalation of commitment to describe this. And if I am honest, even though I do come from an economics background, I actually prefer the term escalation of commitment and the reasoning around it. Uh, research shows that economic study and awareness of sunk costs as a concept doesn't actually improve our ability to cut our losses and move on. However, if we accept that we are flawed humans with emotional brains and make a habit of questioning our decisions, then we can actually take steps towards making more balanced decisions. And if you look at any large or expensive failure, whether it be software development, war, or a business going under, you will find an escalation of commitment. So let's go for a change of scenery, we'll shift now from the conference room to the weight room to the gym. So about a year ago, I started a weight loss journey again, and I like to blame the pandemic and the lack of activity related to that for my weight gain. Um, but in reality, I'd been making poor choices for longer than that. I had tried and failed to regain control by seeking diet and exercise perfection, my, my definition of it anyway. And it would work for a few weeks, but before I'd have a moment of weakness and then I'd give up. So eventually I decided that enough was enough and I hired a personal trainer and a coach. So what do you think the first thing we started working on was? What do you think, what if, hands up if you think diet. Okay, lifting technique. Yeah, and exercises that burn the most calories. Okay, well, those of you that kept your hand down, you're right, because it's actually none of these. <laughs> 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 the first lesson was around habits, specifically forging good habits rather than striving for a perfect result. Consistency over perfection. And any trainer or coach that's worth hiring, they understand this at a fundamental level and they live by it. So not every workout is a perfect workout and not every meal is a perfect meal. Striving for that will just burn you out and increase the chances that you will give up and revert to old habits. So consistency over perfection, Adele, very nice point. But what does that mean in the context of software development? Well, we can actually see this in the principles behind the Agile Manifesto. Hands up if you've actually read the Agile Manifesto. Yeah, that's what I expected. So those of you who haven't, hands up if you think it mentions the word scrum. That's okay, that's all right. Um, so a few of you, that's fine. Uh, in lifting, we refer to this as bro science. So where stories get passed around the gym, usually about the best way to make gains and what happens, it becomes a kind of a folklore, which doesn't really capture the essence of the original idea. And once it gets accepted as truth, it's very hard to change people, people's minds. So anyway, Scrum is agile bro science. And there are two principles behind the Agile Manifesto that I would like to share with you or remind you of. Um, there's absolutely zero shame if you've never seen them before. I mean, that's why we come to conferences, right? To learn. 
So the first principle I'd like to share is our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And the second is deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference for a shorter time scale. Consistency over perfection. So consistency, working software in users' hands as quickly as possible. Respond to feedback with small changes, repeat. Perfection, the pursuit of perfection can lead us further away from our goals to situations of scope creep, over-engineering, or designing for a future that never comes. You know, some of the worst culprits of this are premature scalability or greenfield microservices when you only have a team of six or embarking on a rewrite simply to scratch your nerd itch of working on the latest technologies. But by being consistent with good habits and finding something enjoyable in the process, you can achieve more than you think. In the words of Agile Manifesto signer Kent Beck, I'm not a great programmer, I'm just a good programmer with great habits. Now, some of you might disagree with Kent's humble self-assessment, but whether you agree or not, the message is worth listening to. Our success, or lack thereof, is a product of our habits. Which then leaves the question, how do we form great habits? Anyone who's tried to make a lifestyle change can tell you that it's hard. But striving for consistency over perfection can take you a really long way. So we're going to go back to RJ, Lika, and the team in their original reality, the one where Lika thankfully doesn't get her way, and the team decide to improve what they've got rather than doing a rewrite. And it's also the one where Malcolm is the world's most jacked tech lead. And he's also read the book Atomic Habits by James Clear, an MIT researcher. So... Let's go back to the first conversation that Malcolm and Lika had. You know, what were the biggest grievances Lika had with the project? Slow build, tech debt, sucky documentation. So the day after this conversation, Malcolm and Lika, they sit down and they analyze the project together. They review the SonarCube output, which they use as a measure of technical debt. And remember, we're not going for perfection here, and that also includes our choice of tooling. So they get the following output on the core service. 97 bugs, seven vulnerabilities, and 1987 code smells. See, tech dead off the charts. How do we even begin? Lika is clearly overwhelmed. Unfazed, Malcolm replies, by taking small steps. Malcolm calls the rest of the team over and takes them through the habit-forming template his PT used with him when he decided to get jacked. So step one, start small and be specific. The easiest way to do that is to add a small behavior with a measurable outcome to an existing behavior. So what's something we do regularly that we could build a habit into? In the case of Malcolm and the team, they decide that every merge request or completed user story will remove at least five code smells or one bug. Step two is to find joy in the process, or at least find a way to make the process more tolerable. So many housekeeping type goals, like reducing tech debt, are not glamorous. They can even be pure tedium, but it's important that you find something that works for you. For example, I find embedding the housekeeping work in a feature ticket, the way the team that are do doing here, that's enough for me. I like to know that I left things better than I found them. That applies to code that I review as well. And another one I like is if I can add a feature with a net reduction in lines of code. But, you know, reward and joy can also be other things like going for a walk or a ping pong break, like whatever you need. So the next and possibly most important step is recognizing that you will slip up occasionally. That's normal. You're a human after all. The key point is that you get back on track quickly. If you find yourself at the end, in a rush at the end of the sprint and you just jam the feature in there, that's okay. Just simply pick up the thread on the next story. 
That does come with a small caveat, though, which is to make sure that you do pick up the thread. Because if you slip twice, the, pro uh, the habit is less likely to stick. And you risk ending up with a code base full of Band-Aid fixes. And step four is not really a step, it's more a reminder. It's important to be honest with yourself and with each other. So it might be that you enter a period where bug reports or smells are going up again. You can discuss what's happening with your team in the retro and make a plan. In my team, we've actually had times where we realize we're short on data to just, uh, decide the best path forward, which is when we'll talk about ways to improve this. So at different times, we've added extra logging, updated our dashboards, and created extra load test scenarios. We've com uh, compared how many bugs have found their way into acceptance and production in the current period versus the last period. Uh, even actions like knowledge sharing sessions have helped so that more people know the complex and error prone parts of the application. This also means that different people can provide insights into the issues that the team are seeing. It's important to appreciate though that not every hiccup will require a change of plan. What's needed could simply be just adhering to the original plan a little bit better which is why it's really important for your retros to be a safe space, like free, free, free from blame, but with space for accountability. So you, be, you can be truthful about where things are going wrong and take steps to make things better rather than trying to push the problem outwards. You know, for example, by blaming another team, indecisive uh, stakeholders or a burdensome process. Be really honest with yourself. And lastly, it's important to reflect on your progress, to see how far you've come and reward yourself. So for example, how much has the quality report improved over the last six months? Is velocity starting to increase, even if only a little? Is the code review process faster and more effective? Is the project simply just more joyful to work on? You know, set a date to evaluate your progress, and in the meantime, you can think up some reward ideas. In our team, we like to celebrate our milestones, even the maintenance ones, so getting our, all of our customers on the newest version of the product or migrating the database to reduce our tech stack. So when I first came up with the idea for this talk, I naturally thought of the professions where I had experience or where people close to me have experience. And I actually come from a long line of teachers. There are about 25 of them in my extended family. Yes, my extended Catholic family. Uh, my grandmother's one of 12 and my mother is one of seven. So with that field to play in, I was, so, I was Sure, I'd uncover some great conventional teaching wisdom. I was so confident I even put it in the title when I responded to the CFP. And I thought the insight would be something along the lines of every child is unique, which would translate to every project is unique or every team is unique. But as I got to work and I started collecting everyone's input, I found myself getting pushed in a different direction. Overwhelmingly, the following theme came up. Relationships first. Now, call me oblivious, but it's not really the first thing I think of when I think of teachers. You know, overworked, underpaid, and underappreciated spring to mind. But when I really thought about it, I realized that even though my family is huge, my mom still has updates for me every time that I call her. You know, cousin Barry's up to this, and cousin Yoli's up to that. And they even have a family reunion every few years, Flam family members flying in from all over Australia simply to catch up with each other. And this is like a properly organized reunion with like invitations, a venue, catering. You know, there's even entertainment. I mean, they're the entertainment, but still. I'm convinced that at least part of the reason they say so connected is because of all of the teachers actively making an effort to keep everyone in the loop. A living, breathing example of relationships first. Successful teachers maintain a web of relationships with people who all have different needs. The rationale being that if you can't connect with them, then you can't teach them. And this extends beyond the student, for example, to the student's families, other teachers, school administrators, education department, list goes on. So it becomes that if you can't connect with them, then you can't rely on them, ask a favor of them, do your best work with them, 
trust them, take risks with them. So put your hand up if you're an extrovert. Actually, a couple more hands than I was expecting. <laughs> so believe it or not, despite the fact I'm on this stage, I'm actually an introvert. Uh, building relationships does not come naturally to me. I have to make a conscious effort, and I don't always get it right. For example, it takes months uh, before I have a proper conversation with the new starters of my office. There's like one to two a month, but somehow I always have a backlog. And to let you in on a little secret, one of the reasons I like speaking at conferences is because it gives people an excuse to come up and talk to me. This means I don't have to awkwardly initiate the conversation because trust me, it would be awkward. And yes, that is a shameless request for you to come and say hello after the session. So one day at lunch, Lika is chatting with a developer from another project, Yoast. And even though they see each other uh, regularly in passing, this is the first time they've had a proper conversation. And they start discussing their projects, and it doesn't take long until Yoast starts complaining that his project needs a rewrite. Lika can't help but let out a little giggle. What are you laughing at? Says Yoast, feeling a little judged. I'm sorry, Yost. It's just you sound exactly like me from a few months ago when I joined my current team. What we decided to do instead was work at consistently reducing our tech debt. At first, it seemed really overwhelming, but we've actually made some really good progress. Yost is intrigued. Deep down, he knows that rewrites often fail. He's just really frustrated. Would you mind sharing your approach with my team? Actually, you know what? I know that some other teams are having issues caused by tech debt. They'd love some tips on how to reduce it. Will you be open to running a lunchtime session for us? Lika looks hesitant. Look, it doesn't have to be too formal, reassures Yost. Just give a lightning talk, and then we can break off into some smaller discussion groups. Plus, he added, I know you're a big introvert, just like me. This will be a nice way to get to know more people at the company. I'm sick of having to make awkward conversation at the coffee machine. I have nothing left to say about the weather. And the next week, Lika and Yost run the session. Lika's presentation goes well and kickstarts some great conversations. One of the attendees mentions that in addition to Sonicube, they're making use of a couple of helpful plugins. Lika's head is now full of ideas, which she takes back to her team to implement. And within a week, one of the session attendees approaches Lika to ask how they could go about running their own session. Lika and Yost have started something good. So what Lika and Yost have set in motion is the formation of communities of practice or guilds. And this is where members with a common interest interact regularly to share information, improve their skills, and actively work on advancing the general knowledge of the domain of interests. Um, the key point is that communities of practice are organic and self-directed, and they're a great example of putting relationships first. You know, just like my family reunions. However, unlike my family reunions, the entertainment features robust conversation rather than Uncle Fred's robust share impersonation. So several months have passed and the team has made some good progress in reducing their tech debt. Malcolm brings in a small gift for each uh, member of the team. More importantly, especially for Lika, is that working on the project is becoming more joyful every day. The team are in the middle of opening their gifts when RJ notices the dashboard on the big screen. What's happening here? He wonders out loud. The team stop what they're doing and they huddle around the dashboard. The disk of one of the core service machines is nearly full. Malcolm takes a closer look at the machine and the culprit is a very large and expanding log file. Lika opens up the client for the message broker. One of the queues seems to be blocked, has a large number of messages in the queue, and the number is growing. Overall response times in the app are still OK, and only a small number of users are impacted. The team wants to keep it that way. So Marta, one of the team's devs, draws four columns on the whiteboard and labels them A, N, C, A. ANCA is a concept that Marta picked up while completing her private pilot's license. It resonated with her so much that she introduced it to her team. And after some discussion about its merits and applicability, the team decided to use it as their framework for production issues. Aviate, navigate, communicate, administrate. 
aviate. In other words, fly the aircraft first. When there are competing priorities in the cockpit, it's all too easy to become fixated on one particular issue. For example, a specific alarm, instruction or warning. Aviate reminds the pilots of their number one priority, which is to keep the damn plane in the air. So navigate. So the plane is still in the air and the passengers are delightfully unaware that you're not just sipping coffee and reading the newspaper today. And so what's your current position and where are you going? Can you verify visually where you are? Is the original destination or airport still the best option to go given on the situation you find yourself in? You stay on course until you and your co-pilot decide on a course of action. Oh yeah, and keep flying the plane. Communicate. Should you alert air traffic control about what's happening? What about the cabin crew? You know, be clear with your communication in the cockpit. Acknowledge your co-pilot and repeat back any decisions made so that they can confirm. Administrate. This is a newer addition to the model and often overlook. It's the tasks that enable you to do the other tasks well and may inform your decisions. So in the cockpit, this could mean calculating the estimated time of arrival or how much fuel is remaining. After a safe landing, it could include logging and an incident report. So back at the whiteboard, the team considered the first column, aviate. Now in software development, this could mean two main things. If you're taking a more DevOps approach like Leaker and the team, then the equivalent is running software. Continue serving as many users as possible and minimize disruption. But you can also view Aviate as keeping your system evolvable and debuggable. For example, how much effort is it to onboard a new team member, add features or refactor? And this would be uh, the best approach for pure development teams. So running software, minimum user impact. Marta asked how many users are impacted. Average response times are still acceptable and the number of 500 is low. Uh, as a first course of action, the team make a copy of and delete the log file. And uh, this will keep the application running and buy them some time. RJ keeps a close eye on the dashboard and will alert the team if anything changes. On to navigate. One of the queues is increasing uh, a long way from the goal of near empty queues. One of the devs, Will, volunteers to go through the copied log file. Meanwhile, Malcolm sets up a job to periodically delete the current log file from the problematic node. In the log, Will notices that the application keeps throwing an exception. There is an error process, one of the messages, and the listener just keeps retrying. And on every retry, it fails with the same exception. Now, this is a Java application, so what exception do you think that it's throwing? I think I heard it, null pointer exception, yes. So, Will communicates his findings with the team. Uh, and Marta writes them in the third column on the whiteboard. RJ yells out that the response times and 500s are still good. And Malcolm says that with the current log file being periodically deleted, sufficient disk space is being maintained. And at this point, the improvement plan is clear to the team. Find and fix the null pointer exception, shut down all the nodes of the application during a low use period and wait for the queues to clear. Shovel the remaining messages into a temporary queue so they can be inspected and restart the app. Implement a dead letter queue and reassess the retry policy. So the last step, administrate, is to create tickets for the immediate fixes, add them to the sprint and inform the customer. Improvements such as implementation of the dead letter queue can be added to the backlog and refined. So in this talk, we followed Lika and the team through a number of situations that you might encounter in your role as a software professional. And in each situation, they leverage a concept well known in another profession. 
So we saw RJ School Leaker on opportunity cost when choosing between alternatives. Now, like it or not, there is an economic component to software development. We build things that are useful to others. And whether your customers are internal or external, there is an expectation that you provide the most value for a given amount of resources. And opportunity costs help us compare the costs and benefits of alternatives and choose accordingly. Consistency over perfection when looking to make improvements and form productive habits. So by focusing on your habits rather than only on outcomes, you can start to invest in the process and find joy in it. Take small steps and check in regularly and see how far your team has come. Agile already provides some tools for, for reflection, although a big favorite of mine are blameless and honest retrospectives. Putting relationships first to enhance learning and collaborations between teams. You know, we can't claim to be a learning profession if there are no teachers. You put your relationships first and find ways to engage with and teach each other. And we saw Marta apply the model Aviate, Navigate, Communicate, Administrate to deal with a production issue uh, in the team. But the model is not limited to just production issues. You can also use it as a framework to plan the evolution of your application. And in their alternate reality, Leek and the team could have avoided some pain had they been aware of the human tendency to escalate a commitment once a significant investment of time and resources has been made. So back at the bar, the developer has just confirmed that yes, their office does have a ping pong table. And the economist rolls their eyes and scoffs and like, see? But that's hardly a reason to claim I have the easiest job, protests the developer. Things are starting to get heated now, but just before it becomes an all out brawl, someone walks in that shuts them all up. It's none other than Sir Patrick Stewart. And despite their difference, says so one thing the economist, teacher, and develop all have in common is that they are mad Trekkies. And quickly, for you that don't know, Patrick Stewart is most no well known for his role as Jean Luc Picard in Star Trek, followed closely by being the bald guy in these memes. And so, astonished and with zero shame after a few beers, the developer asks Sir Patrick for some advice. So here are five things we could learn from Patrick Stewart in Patrick's own words. Be aware of your limitations, but don't take yourself too seriously. I don't do impersonations. I can do a wounded elephant. I can do a really good cow. And I do a variety of sheep, all of which I would be happy to roll out for you. Have an outlet. The only still center of my life is Macbeth. To go back to doing this bloody, crazed, insane mass murderer is a huge relief after trying to get my cell phone replaced. Keep your balance. It still frightens me a little to think that so much of my life was totally devoted to Star Trek and almost nothing else. The unconventional path might be the perfect path for you. One day, out of irritation, I said, you know, all of these years with the Royal Shakespeare Company was nothing but a preparation for sitting in the captain's chair of the Enterprise. And lastly, be fearless, be you. If someone says, give me one word of advice, I say, be fearless. And knowing without any shadow of a doubt that what they have to give who they are is totally unique and not shared by anybody else, and to believe in that uniqueness. My name is Adele, and thank you so much for your time. That's it. I just, uh, uh, you might want to take a picture, I'll put the slides up, uh, but this is just some references and further reading. Thank you very much for that. Well, we actually have a couple of minutes what? left. You, you are early. So, are there any questions from the audience? As I said, more than welcome to come up after the session. I'm here all week. 
Okay, and a pen, is my mic working now? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, so thank you very much again. Another round of applause for Adele, and I will see you all in uh, 15 minutes for the next session. <laughs> <laughs>